Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet on the video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, um, more than 6,600 aircraft have now been grounded worldwide. Where do we park these aircraft? How do we actually find parking for them? And what kind of maintenance is required in order to keep these aircraft ready to go when this crisis is over? Stay tuned. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant. Now I know that you are a curious person. That's the reason why you're here and why you are watching this video. But maybe you're finding yourself now sitting at home with very little to do, or maybe you find yourself trying to homeschool a teenager that doesn't really want to go into things like mathematics and physics. Well then I highly recommend you to use this link and check out Brilliant. Okay? They have more than 60 different courses in things like calculus, which believe it or not, they can make fun to learn, or coding, or mathematical fundamentals, or problem solving. And the way that they will do this is that they will bring you through a journey from the fundamentals of a subject up to increasing kind of complexity. And whenever you come across something that you don't really understand, well then they will give you a good explanation to it, show you some examples, and after a while you find yourself solving the most complex things using these kind of building blocks of information and knowledge. Now those of you who goes down and uses this link, you'll get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. And I highly recommend you to go down and check it out. No matter what, it will surprise you the kind of things that you'll learn. All right, guys. So last week I did a video about why the skies are not empty yet. We know that most of the airlines around the world have um, stated that they will be grounding either their entire fleet or big parts of their fleet. So I explained that over the next coming weeks or month, we will see less and less aircraft flying. Now this would indicate that these aircraft that are not flying needs to be parked somewhere. And you would think that like you and your car, you would have a parking space for your car if you own a car. But the fact is that it's not that easy. Right now we have more than 6,600 aircraft grounded worldwide and that number is increasing by the day. The way that the parking structure for aircraft is built around the world is that it has calculated that while one aircraft might be parked for 25 minutes for a turnaround, maybe a couple of hours or maybe even 24 hours, there will always be a lot of other aircraft flying at the same time. So as these aircraft are parked, other aircraft is going to be over the Atlantic, over Europe, somewhere, right? So at any given time, there is always going to be aircraft airborne. This means that there's no need to have parking for every single aircraft at a time. The only real time that we've seen this happening before was after the uh, terrorist attacks of 9-11 where you had a grounding of a big part of the American fleet, for example. But that didn't park all of the aircraft of the world. But what we're seeing right now is that an unprecedented number is sitting on the ground. And this is posing some real problems for the airlines out there. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, we are going to be talking about the maintenance needed of these aircraft. But before we even get there, you need to realize that the parking facilities that we're looking at right now, if you look at Asia, for example, or continental Europe, is basically closed off runways, right? The bigger airports out there, the ones that have more than one runway, they are now closing off parts of their runway system and making that into makeshift parking spots. Now the issue with that is that you need to park aircraft in a way that they can be utilized, they can be moved for example, because that forms part of the maintenance cycle. And also if the airlines decide that they need one aircraft, well they don't want that to be parked in among 15 other aircraft. So just finding and placing the aircraft for parking is much much more advanced and much more complex than you might think. Now, on top of that, you have the fact that some airlines might have bases in only maybe three or four airports 
around a country like the US, for example, or in Europe. But those airports does not have the parking capability to park their entire fleet. This means that if those aircraft are now parked out on different airports, well then the airline need to have maintenance facilities, maintenance personnel at these other airports that can do the maintenance. Now, to a certain extent, that can be covered by, for example, contracting in other airlines, maintenance personnel, uh, giving them specific training on these aircraft that, that tend not to, to be big differences in between them. But in any case, this requires a lot of, you know, planning and work for the airlines. So what is needed then? Well, let's say that you have parked your aircraft temporarily and the air, airline thinks that it's a reasonable chance that this aircraft is going to be back up and flying very soon. Well, in that case, what you can do is you can put the aircraft into what's called active storage. Um, this means that you can kind of slow down the ongoing maintenance. Remember that the aircraft normally needs to have a daily inspection at least every 48 hours. This can be scaled down to maybe every week or so. Right? So different airlines will have slightly different maintenance schedules, but they will be pulled out, they'll be stretched out a little bit. Now what needs to be done is that uh, an aircraft like a 737, for example, every week needs to have its engine run. Okay, so in any circumstance, every week, the engine needs to be started up. That's generally done by engineers who are trained to do so. And the engine should be run at idle for about 15 to 20 minutes. And the reason you want to run it that long is that you need to, to heat it up enough to get rid of any moisture that might have gathered inside of the engine components. You also want to make sure that all of the engine components are lubricated and they can move properly. And also, finally, you want them to be kind of covered by a protective coat of oil to make sure that you don't get any corrosion to the components. Okay? Now this goes for the auxiliary power unit as well, the APU, because that's essentially a jet engine for exactly the same reason. Uh, you also want to make sure that at least every week you fire up the elec electrics of the aircraft, check that all of the electric systems are working, that the flight management computer is working. And you might also want to switch on the hydraulics, let the pump run, all right? So these are the kind of things that needs to be done on at least a weekly basis. Uh, most airlines will also make sure that the aircraft move a little bit in order to avoid flat spots on the, uh, on the um, uh, tires. Um, and when you see that it's going to be a week or more, um, the pitot probes, for example, need to be covered. You, you should cover up the static ports as well. And any time that you cover up either a pitot probe or a static port on an aircraft, you need to make sure that that's properly put into the maintenance manual of the aircraft so it can be removed before, before flight. The aircraft also needs to be um, ventilated, you know, opening up the doors, for example, to make sure that you get some fresh air moving through. Um, and when you do so, especially if you're using the big parking facilities that you have in the US, for example, which tends to be up in um, places like Tulsa, New Mexico. Um, well, in that case, there might be dust, desert dust coming in, which means that you're gonna have to do a proper deep cleaning of the aircraft before you bring it back to service. Now you might ask, okay, so if you're parking all of the aircrafts on airports in, the Euro in Europe, uh, in US you have these big boneyards, that's in these big parking places out in the desert. The reason that you park the aircraft in places like New Mexico is because you have a very dry climate there. And that plays a pivotal role if you want to store the aircraft over a prolonged period of time, all right? Because there are a few things that is the enemy of an aircraft standing on the ground. And one of them is corrosion that comes with water, with uh, humidity. So the drier you can put the aircraft in, the drier kind of climate, the better it will be, the easier it will be to maintain them for a long time. Okay, good. So what about if the air, what about if the, so what about if the airline decides that actually it doesn't look like we are going to get these aircraft back into service anytime soon? Maybe we're looking at three months more of storage. 
Well, in that case, you can put the aircraft into what's called deep storage. Now, deep storage is a much more complex maintenance procedure, and it will uh, require a lot more man hours to get the aircraft back into flying condition if you choose to go into deep storage. But the positive side of deep storage is that it will cost about half of what it would cost you to have it in active storage. Now, in deep storage, uh, you will have to remove some of the more critical components of the aircraft. So, for example, the battery is really removed. There's some other components as well that's going to be taken physically out of the aircraft and put into separate storage. But the engines, the engines are fitted to the aircraft and you won't take them off in a jiffy, all right? So, they need to be taken well care of. The engines are the single most expensive part of an aircraft. So, in case of deep storage, the way you will do it is you will kind of pickle them. This means that you will drain out all of the oil of the engine and replace it with a mixture of oil and anti-corrosive uh, liquid. That will then be run through the kind of engine components to make sure that everything is properly covered by it um, to avoid big corrosion. And on top of that, you know those little uh, silicate bags that you get when you buy electronics, for example. Now, those silicate bags that you find in the box, they're there to remove any moisture. And in case of a long time storage of an engine, you need to do the same thing. So they will be placing these larger bags of these kind of uh, silicates in the engine to suck out all of the moisture. And then you put gauges in to monitor the moisture content inside of the engine. And once you have done that, then you can seal the engine up. This means that you seal both the back of the engine and the forward part of the engine to avoid things like um, insects coming in, animals building nests in there, birds nesting, things like that. And that way you can also monitor how the engine is actually doing over a long period of time. Okay? After that, all of the openings, the static probes, the pitot probes, any kind of hole that might let something in needs to be sealed up with uh, vinyl tape. Uh, there is loads of different lubricants that needs to be applied to loads of different places on the aircraft on regular intervals to make sure that they don't kind of, you know, seal up, basically. The aircraft cabin will be completely darkened, so all of the, uh, uh, the window blinds will come down and the cockpit windows will be sealed with a reflective um, material of some sort to make sure that the temperature doesn't rise too high and damage instrumentation inside of the cockpit. Uh, the uh, uh, seats and the carpets needs to be covered as well. Um, to make sure that there's no moisture building up and eventually mildew forming inside of the um, aircraft cabin. You need to spray a protective coating on all metal surfaces that aren't painted. That's another thing as well. And then each and every week, someone needs to enter the aircraft and switch on the electrics. Once again, to check that everything is working. Every 30 days, you need to move the aircraft about one third of the wheel. Um, to avoid these flat spots from developing. And you also crucially need to drain the fuel tanks of any water. So basically the water will tend to gather at the bottom of the fuel tank. You need to drain that out because if you don't, if water is standing inside of the engine and it sits there for a prolonged period of time, there will be loads of bacteria building up. And that bacteria turns into um, kind of like creme fraiche, type of fluid that will then block any fuel filters and things. So that needs to be taken care of as well. Now on top of that, if the aircraft is standing for more than 90 days, uh, all of the rudder surfaces, uh, flight surfaces needs to be ex exercised. So switching on the hydraulics, moving ailerons, moving um, flaps, moving rudder, uh, moving the elevator, things like that, just to make sure that everything is working properly. And then if the aircraft is scheduled to stand for a year, then each year the aircraft needs to be propped up on, uh, on stilts basically in order to let the landing gear be moved a couple of times as well. Now the uh, uh, aircraft manufacturers, both Boeing and Airbus for some of their types have said that every year you need to put the aircraft back into flying condition. So instead of just letting the aircraft do these intermediate checks, then 
when it's been standing for a year, the uh, maintenance department needs to go in, bring the aircraft back into full flying service. That means bringing the oil back into the engines, running the engines again, moving the aircraft around, probably even flying it a little bit, and then bring it back into deep storage. All right? So if the aircraft has come into deep storage and it needs to be taken out of deep storage, um, there's approximately 120 man hours needed in order to do so, right? In order to get the engines back up running again and run all of the checks in order to make sure that the aircraft is ready to go. So this, uh, hopefully, we won't have to see as part of this crisis, but we'll definitely see that uh, with, for example, the 737 Maxis that have been stored for over a year right now. So this means that if you see an airline that have loads of these aircraft, um, it can take several weeks up to months to get a whole fleet back up and running again, right? So as you can see, guys, um, once again, whenever it comes to running anything that has to do with the airline business, there are robust procedures in place. It's not like what you would do with your car if you're not going to use it for a while, which is just leave it outside and then hope it starts up, maybe putting the battery on, uh, on like charge. No, no, no. This is taking care of each and every component following a very specific roster to make sure that everything under any circumstance is working properly. And this is what we can expect will happen as well, especially if this crisis means that we're going to have aircraft grounded for a prolonged period of time. Now, I suspect that you have questions about this. Maybe you have some comments to put in as well. Hopefully a like to the video as well. I wanted to put that in here below. I love reading your comments. And uh, also, I hope that I have kind of earned a subscription from you, if you haven't already. Um, if you subscribe, then make sure that you highlight the uh, notification bell as well. Because right now, as you can see, I am still grounded. I'm still sitting at home um, and I'll probably be doing that for the next two weeks or maybe the next month, which means that I'm doing more live streams and stuff like that. And if you haven't highlighted the bell, you might not be notified when I do a spontaneous live stream or when there's an extra video being sent out, which I'm trying to do as much as possible now. And before you go, I want you, after this, to go in and check out mentorpilot.com. I have created a service called Rent a Pilot and it's going live today, all right? Now, it is in a kind of test mode right now. So if you're quick enough, you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to rent a pilot for maybe you just want to chat with someone. Maybe you want someone to instruct you on how to do a proper setup of the Airbus 320 or the Boeing 737 on your home flight simulator or you just want some advice from an ATPL teacher. I have created rent a pilot for one specific reason and that is that I realized that a lot of my colleagues out there are now sitting without an income. Some of them have lost their jobs completely, some of them are on furlough and I wanted to kind of bring all of their fantastic knowledge and experience to you. This means that this is a paid service guys and I'm going to have a huge reduction in price during the first week to test out the system. So I want to say that it is a this is a trial week, okay? But please go in and also send me feedback. Right? You can use the app to send me feedback. You can use the uh, the mentorpilot.com website to send me messages about a what you think about the service, b if there's something else you would like to see. We are going to do our damnedest to try to find as much cool new stuff for you as we can possibly come up with. So go into mentorpilot.com, check out Rent a Pilot, let me know what you think. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye bye.